Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning at Claremont United Church of Christ. It is so good to be here with you online, worshiping our God. Even during the pandemic, we still have these moments of transition in our life, and our faith is something that helps us mark those moments of transition. And this is a day when we want to celebrate our high school graduates who are part of our church to wish them well as they go on to the next adventures in their life and to help them mark this very important occasion, to let them know that we are with them even as they begin their next chapters. So let's watch this short video of what our graduates will be up to. Good morning, everyone. We have a special message for our graduates this morning. We know that it has been a challenge these last few weeks as you were finishing up and certainly The graduation ceremonies that you had planned probably did not look a whole lot like the ones that took place, but it is a celebration and a milestone nonetheless. And we as your church are so proud of you and we wanted to take a moment to recognize your achievements. It has been so cool to see so many celebrities give you well wishes and commencement speeches, everyone from LeBron James to President Obama, but we have some really great people to add to that list the folks of our own congregation who want to wish all of you a happy graduation, and we'll also be hearing a special message from our graduates themselves. Let's watch. Hi, I'm Shade River Roberts, and I'm graduating from Claremont High School. After my graduation, I will be attending Rio Hondo College for two years, and then transferring to Cal State Fullerton for a major in psychology and a minor in music in order to pursue my career in music therapy. Hi, I'm Lena Sarakovic, and I'll be graduating from Upland High School. I'll be attending Cal State Long Beach in the fall with a major in communications and a minor in film, and I hope to pursue a career in the film industry. Go Beach! Hi, my name is Maxine Perungal. I'm going to be graduating from Walnut High School, and this fall I plan on majoring in mathematics at UC Santa Cruz. Hi, I'm Milo Santiago, and I'll be graduating from Walnut High School this year. My post-graduation plans are to study applied mathematics at Washington University in St. Louis. Claremont United Church of Christ is a beautiful and welcoming community, and I'd like to thank them for all the kindness and support they've shown me this past year. Thank you. Hey, 2020 graduates, congratulations on this excellent achievement. You should feel very proud of yourself. I wanted to share a word of wisdom that has always served me well, and it comes from Maya Angelou. She said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, they will forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. So always be kind, make people feel good, and always leave them better off than when you found them. Congratulations again, and very well done. Happy Happy graduation! Thank you, everyone. Please know that this church is always a home for you that you can come back to and know you are loved here. We wish you the very best. Everyone, please join me for today's call to worship. We've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, Trusting in God's holy word, God has never failed us yet. We can't turn around, for we've come this far by faith. Please join me in singing our opening hymn. The words will be on the screen for all the saints.
Amen. Saints, I invite you to join me in today's prayer of confession as we bring ourselves before God. Please pray with me. Eternal God, we are trying to live as your disciples, and yet we still find that our fears run deep and we cannot overcome them by ourselves. We worry so much and talk ourselves out of facing challenges and stepping outside of our familiar habits. Remind us once again that to deepen our faith, we must learn to fully trust you. Teach us to lean into your promises and strengthen our connection with you and with one another. Amen. Jesus asked, Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. Let us cast our worries aside and place our trust in our God, who has never abandoned us. Amen. I invite you to proclaim together our covenant of faith. In response to God's creating, redeeming, and sustaining love, we unite for the worship of God and the service of all. We seek to know the will of God and to walk in God's ways made known in Jesus Christ, to love one another, to proclaim the gospel to all the world, to work and pray for peace and justice, and to live in harmony with all creation. We trust the presence of the Holy Spirit in trial and rejoicing, and the promise of eternal life, both now and forevermore. Amen. Friends, as we share the peace of Christ today, we are beginning a new sermon series entitled, Saints We Should Know. And in the Protestant church, we talk about how we are all saints, that we are one great big cloud of witnesses. So as you pass the police, please share someone in your life who has already passed, who you think of as such a pivotal figure, a saint in your life, who has helped guide you and lead you. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Hello, young friends. It's so good to see you this Sunday. Listen, we have a really great story that we want to share with you today. There was an older couple in our church who needed help grocery shopping. You've probably heard that older people or people that are at risk are not supposed to leave their homes right now to stay safe. And so we have some wonderful volunteers in our congregation who are doing grocery shopping for them. And one couple had such a great experience that they turned it into a little story for this man and his family, especially his daughters, to read and enjoy it. And we want to share it with you because we think it is such a great story. So here we go. Once upon a time, there were two older people named Penelope and David. They were running out of food. We have no fresh bread, Penelope sighs. We're all out of apples, David replies. And where is more cereal? They both scratched their heads. Our cupboards are bare. How shall we be fed? They couldn't take off and go shopping away. They were older and were told to stay in and not stray. They didn't want ice cream or specialty treats. They wanted cereal and good things to eat. A lucky thing happened for this older pair. A kind man said, I'll shop for you. Tell me when, what, and where. So they gave him a list and added things twice and he bought bags of good food, yams, peas, fruit, and rice. They had never met him, only talked on the phone. Then they learned that he had two daughters at home. So we write you this poem and know you'll be gladdy to know this nice man was your very own daddy. Please give him special thank you hugs. 
So we love that story of two families that connected through this grocery shopping in our church, and we wanted to share it with all of you because we know that so many of you are good, kind, young disciples of Jesus, and you're ready to do good deeds as well. Special shout out to Francesco Barbera and Natalie Buck and Uriel Ojeda and the Stark family and so many others that we know have been doing grocery shopping and errands for those who are in need. Ann Bennett and many others, we thank all of you. Friends, let's close together with a prayer. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. For the chance to be kind. For the chance to be kind. And the chance to help others. And the chance to help others. Open our hearts. Open our hearts. So that we may share your love. So that we may share your love. With everyone. With everyone. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. We'll see you next week. We want to thank you before we take today's offering online for just such a successful stewardship season, which ended last week. We had over 53 new pledging households that had not pledged the year before. That is an incredible amount of growth in this church. And I think it just shows how many people in our community are becoming part of our wider mission. And so we give thanks for each and every one of you that joined us during stewardship season as we turn our eyes to the future of what God is doing. You can now give online if you would like. Instructions are in the status of this Facebook post, and we're posting it on the screen so that you can do it either by mail or through our website. We thank you for your generosity.
Please pray with me. We make our offering today with gratitude for the past and hope for the future. Amen. Our scripture today comes from the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are all called into one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Creator through Him. Last Sunday, we toasted the end of our successful stewardship campaign and also the end of our sermon series, Seeing 2020, Envisioning a Faithful Future. And during that series, we explored biblical texts that involved visions and dreams as we together spent time envisioning and dreaming about our future here at Claremont UCC. Today, we are kicking off a new sermon series, Saints We Should Know, because one thing that is providing a lot of comfort and hope to us right now is the reminder that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who have paved the road of discipleship for us and continue to cheer us on as we navigate our world today. And while other Christian denominations, specifically the Roman Catholic Church, do a great job of celebrating and talking about some of those saints we could probably use a little boost in our knowledge and understanding of some of these amazing Christians who have done so much for our faith tradition and for the whole world. We are beginning today with a saint who makes a perfect bridge between our last sermon series, which was about dreams and visions, to our new sermon series, which is about saints, because this saint is quite famous for her lifelong visions. And I believe that her life is a living, beautiful example of how today's scripture passage from the Apostle Paul looks when it is fully lived out. Her name is Hildegard of Bingen. She was born in the year 1098 in Bingen, Germany, and she was the 10th daughter of a noble family. In that time and place, Families would often make sure that they had enough children to inherit their property and manage their assets, and then they would pledge their extra children to the church, especially if they had a lot of children. In Hildegard's case, being the 10th child, she was basically considered a tithe to the church. And because we just finished stewardship season, you all know that a tithe is the Christian practice of giving one-tenth of all your belongings to God. So if any of you feel like you might have a few extra children in your household that you could spare, you could always consider this as an option. But this was actually often the case with monastics of the medieval period. It's not that they chose that life like they might do today, but rather their families decided for them. Now that might seem a bit oppressive to us modern Americans who for the most part were given permission by our parents to chase whatever dreams we had and whatever professions we wanted to enter. But for Hildegard, this would have been considered a very important job to spend her entire life praying for her family and her community. And she took it very seriously. So she went into the monastic life around age eight. Now it should also be mentioned that she had already been having these visions. She says later that they happened around age three. And already by age five, she understood that these were visions from God, but she also understood that a lot of people would not believe her if she talked about these, so she kept them to herself for years and years. It actually wasn't until Hildegard was 42 years old that she experienced what she calls a midlife awakening. Now, I love that term because it's so much more 
uh, celebratory and positive than the shameful term midlife crisis, a midlife awakening is full of possibility for the future. So if you're in your 40s and 50s and beyond and you're trying to justify to your spouse why you want to, I don't know, shave your head or switch careers or start training for your first marathon, you could maybe use Hildegard's term to warm them up to that idea. It's a midlife awakening. For Hildegard, the midlife awakening was the vision of God telling her to write down everything she was experiencing and hearing during these visions. Now, at first, she resisted, again, thinking that people would not believe her. They might be suspicious of her and think that she was having visions from the devil or something nefarious. So she stopped. She wouldn't do it. But as she resisted, she began to feel ill. And she actually became bedridden at one point because she was in extreme pain. Only then did she decide she had to do what this voice of God was telling her to do and um, start talking about these visions. And so first she had to get permission from the head abbess, who then inquired up the chain of power all the way to the Pope. And she was granted papal permission to write about her visions. And once Hildegard finally did this, her illness subsided. Now, Hildegard's visions were full of colors. They were vivid and expressive. They were full of wisdom and reflections on God's relationship to humanity and creation, who and what God is like, the purpose and the role of the church, and even how nature and plants can heal us. These were recorded into a series of books which became well-circulated and well-read and many parts have survived today, the most famous being the skivias, which means know the ways of the Lord. And Hildegard would experience these visions in the middle of the day while she was awake, so she wasn't asleep and dreaming. And every time she would delay writing down what she had seen and heard during these visions, she would fall ill again. And every time she would finally write them down, her illnesses would subside. Now, some people today would maybe try and diagnose her with migraines, which um, sometimes cause hallucinations and swirling lights and vivid colors. But in her writings, Hildegard is very clear that she only felt ill when she did not appropriately share her visions with the world. Now, medieval artists, perhaps some of them were fellow monastics, began to try and create visual images that illustrate what Hildegard is describing and what she's seeing and experiencing in these visions. So I'm going to show you some images that are gonna come up on your screen of some of these illustrations that people have done over the, the centuries to try and create what it is that she talked about seeing. And you can see how beautiful they are. They're almost like mandalas with swirling, bright, colorful images. This midlife awakening is also when Hildegard began composing. She is the earliest female composer we have in the Western canon, and her music is hauntingly beautiful. It's theologically rich. Her collection, Ordo Virtutum, contains no less than 69 musical compositions, each with its own original poetic text, making it one of the largest repertoires among medieval composers. And around this same time, Hildegard began writing practical guides about nature and healing. Her first guide was originally called The Book of Subtleties of the Diverse Nature of Creatures. That's quite a mouthful, but it was simply a guide to using and understanding herbs and plants as medicine, even how to use stones to heal your spirits based on their inner, inner crystal composition and the structure of their atoms. So if you thought crystal healing and herbal remedies were new age hippy dippy ideas, you're wrong. Hildegard was writing about them prolifically in the Middle Ages. She wrote over 2,000 remedies, which are believed to be inspired, not researched, because she had no way of conducting research for thousands of herbal remedies within her small cloistered community. And yet, they are so advanced and time-tested that German physicians still implement them widely today. Hildegard was a great cook, 
And we can now look back and see that all of her recipes were remedies. Can you imagine with all of the cooking that we're all doing in our homes these days, if every meal was a remedy for our bodies? What a beautiful way to understand food. You can go online and search for Hildegard recipes. There are instructions on how to plant a Hilda garden, which is a garden full of herbs and edible plants. And I promise you, you will be inspired. She also wrote a lot about the greening process of nature and how we must all be a part of this greening process, connecting us to planet Earth. She believed that the care of the earth was part of our responsibility as followers of Christ. And she wrote, if we fall in love with creation deeper and deeper, we will respond to its endangerment with passion. It's like she was speaking to us in our time and place over 900 years later. It seems natural that when Hildegard's predecessor, Jutta, passed away, her sisters voted for her to become the new prioress. But there were some notable differences between how the two women led. Jutta, her predecessor, had been a severe practitioner of asceticism, including penitential self-flagellation or whipping. She wore a chain underneath her habit. She prayed barefoot in the extreme cold of the German winters, and she refused any of the prescribed modifications to the Benedictine diet for anyone who fell sick. Hildegard, on the other hand, was known to be much more relaxed about the Benedictine order. She considered the human body to be a temple for the divine, something to treat with reverence and respect and not to be beaten or tortured. In contrast to the teachings of Jutta and St. Augustine and others at the time who were um, emphasizing human depravity and original sin, Hildegard affirmed humankind's inherent goodness. She wrote, every creature is a glittering, glistening mirror of divinity. This is not to say that Hildegard ignored evil or suffering, but she believed that the spark of God within each of us is always greater than the temptation to do wrong. She once wrote, even in a world that's being shipwrecked, remain brave and strong. Again, those words speak directly to us in our time and place. As her works began to circulate, she was invited to travel and speak and preach to crowds in Germany and Switzerland and France. She went on four different preaching tours where people would come in crowds to hear her wisdom. She has been called a polymath, which means she had an encyclopedic knowledge. The Dominican scholar Matthew Fox said, if Hildegard had been a man, she would have been well known as one of the greatest artists and intellectuals the world has ever seen. My favorite story about Hildegard, I've saved for last. Near the end of her life, she was in her 80s, and she protected the remains of a man who had been excommunicated by the church because he had been a revolutionary. Hildegard argued that he had confessed his sins before he died, and therefore he deserved to rest on hallowed ground. Now, to make sure that his body wasn't disturbed, she went out to the graveyard and removed all traces of his grave so that it could not be found. When confronted about her actions, she told the bishop, I fear the justice of God more than the justice of men. The bishop did not agree and placed her entire monastery under an interdict, which was a sentence forbidding them from receiving church privileges or participating in church functions. This meant that they couldn't receive communion and they couldn't sing the Benedictine office, which is a major part of their lifestyle. After eight months of this, Hildegard wrote him a letter warning him those who silence the music of God on earth will have no part of God's music in heaven. And lo and behold, the interdict was lifted. 
Now, we're calling Hildegard a saint, but the story of her canonization, that is, the official process of the Catholic Church admitting someone into sainthood, is a little messy. She was one of the first persons for whom the canonization process was officially applied, but the process took four attempts, and it was actually never fully completed. However, some branches of the Catholic Church just began referring to her as a saint because she was so widely known and so well-loved and respected. And numerous popes referred to Hildegard as a saint, including Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedictine, Benedict XVI. Now, perhaps even more significant, in 2012, Pope Benedict XVI did give her what's called the equivalent canonization, meaning she was officially adopted as a saint, despite not having completed that official process. And he named her a doctor of the church that same year. And that's a title that's given to teaching theologians in the Roman Catholic Church. This title makes her notably the fourth woman among 36 saints who have that title. I share the life and stories of St. Hildegard with you today to remind you of the truths and wisdom that she offers as her legacy over 900 years after she lived. In summary, here they are. It is never too late to have an awakening in life. Trust the still small voice of God when it speaks to you and invites you into a life of creativity, wonder, and healing. Being made in the image of God means we too our creators. If you have a song inside you, sing it. If you have a vision, share it. Keeping it inside will not feel as good as letting it out into the world. Use food to heal your body. Pay attention to the healing powers of the natural world. Practice holistic health. Be kind to your body, for it is a vessel for the divine. Never be afraid to speak truth to power and to defend the innocent outcasts against unjust practices. You may not be fully recognized or appreciated or rewarded for your work and influence in your lifetime, but that doesn't mean that you haven't made an impact on the world. My final Hildegard lesson for you today is this. During this time of chaos, confusion, and change, may we, we might be tempted to think that our global society is in a holding pattern, that we are going dormant for the year, that 2020 has been the biggest letdown of the century. So I want to remind you that in the same way, we often think of the Middle Ages as the Dark Ages, a period that began with the fall of Rome in 476 and lasted about a thousand years, a time when sickness was prevalent, societies were in shambles, invasions and mass migrations and restructuring of class systems were happening, and nothing good was taking place in the world. But looking back, we can see that it was in this period that Hildegard was writing and composing and speaking and teaching and cooking and cultivating knowledge that is still useful today. It was in this period that hearts and minds were expanding and shifting and stretching so that the Renaissance, the age of enlightenment, could burst forth. I'll be watching the live stream with you on Sunday morning. So as we move into our closing hymn together, I would love to see in the comments what fact or story or lesson from the life of Hildegard is speaking to you most today. What do you find most inspiring about her? And how will you implement the wisdom of her life into your own? My prayer for us today is that we will all be inspired by Hildegard, a woman who was devoted to God, in love with the planet, passionate about justice, and kind to herself and others. Amen.
Join in singing, I love to tell the story. Join me now in a word of prayer. God of light and life, we continue to live through this period of deep disruption, chaos, and anxiety. The things and people we hold most dear have been separated from us, and the normal order of life has been turned upside down. We have been seeking you in the midst of the shadows and fumbling for you in the dark. We remind ourselves today that you are not found in the wind or the earthquake or the fire. You, the creator of the universe, are present in a still, small voice. And yet that still, small voice continues to speak to us like a steady, soothing voice that encourages us not to lose hope, that we can work together to weather this storm. And so, God of silence and stillness, we trust that you are with us in this time of noise and chaos. We continue to pray for an end to this pandemic. Whisper your words of comfort, inspiration, and hope to all who need them in these days of fear. Draw close to those who are sick and all those who risk illness, caring for them, protecting and uplifting them, We ask that you send our graduating seniors out into the world with courage and strength as they pursue their dreams. Impress upon their hearts the love and support of our congregation who will be cheering them on in their endeavors for years to come. And it is with hope 
for your continued inspiration that we pray together the words that you taught us, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. to the world in the safety of your own home, that is. And remember the life and lessons of Hildegard, who spent a time that many of us think as the dark ages, as a time when she was cultivating richness and uh, sharing her visions of her inner life with God, with the world, and cultivating that which will eventually go out and change the world. May it be so for all of us as well. Go in peace in the name of our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Thank you. 